Good morning. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Father in heaven, the song that we just heard expresses the longing of every one of our hearts to be known and loved just as we are. It's a God-given longing that we are so incapable of fulfilling or achieving apart from you. Only you know and love each of us perfectly, and only you can give us the capacity to love each other as you have loved us. We thank you for loving us, and we pray that you would keep expanding our ability to love others well, to share the good news of your love, and to invite others into community where your spirit guides and transforms each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Michelle Rader, lead elder here at Damascus Road. And this is our concluding series in a t- series called The Elephant in the Church, where we have been having a public conversation about the issues surrounding people who identify as LGBTQ and how we as Christian believers and a Christian community can relate to people who have those experiences. And I want to acknowledge up front that we um, have probably raised more questions than answers for many people with this series. And the questions raised depend in large part upon your own experiences that you bring to this, whether you know someone who identifies as LGBTQ, what your experience with that person has been, maybe stories that you've read in the news, opinions that you've already formed. And we have not answered or even begun to answer all the questions. And we won't answer them all today, I hate to tell you. We knew we would not be able to answer all the questions people would have at this series, and we never intended it to be a comprehensive and final word on this topic, but to be the start of an ongoing conversation in our church about how we can be a church that truly welcomes all seekers after God, no matter their background, experience, or current identity. And from that perspective, it's been a success. We have certainly gotten the conversation started, I can tell you. And it's pretty safe to say, I think, that uh, this series has generated more emails, more phone calls, more lunches, and one-on-one conversations, and more questions than any other series that we have done. And we want to keep those conversations going. This is not a one-and-done conversation for us as a church. And I want to encourage everyone to keep reaching out to elders, staff, pastors, each other. Keep asking the questions and keep the dialogue going. We are all committed to continuing this conversation with you because it's a vital part of the gospel message. We are all committed to keep growing in our understanding of how to invite and welcome everyone who seeks God and his hope and salvation. And this quote from Tim Keller, I think, sums up the reality for us behind this series. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It's what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty that life can throw at us. And behind every story and every issue, for every one of us, I think, is this reality. Now, before we dive into our scripture today, I thought it would be helpful to provide a few takeaways that we hope have been clear in this series. Like I said, we uh, haven't begun to answer every question, but some questions do keep coming up again and again. And so I think it will be helpful if we review the things that we really do want everyone to clearly take away from these four weeks. And these are also on the insert in your bulletin if you want to follow along. First, the acronym LGBTQ represents a large and very diverse group of people, concerns, issues, experiences, dreams, and goals. And we cannot and must not make overly globalizing statements about this group, about their agenda or their issues or the causes and solutions for their challenges and questions. Christians have sadly done that too much and it's not helpful. And like any group of people, there is a politically active segment of the LGBTQ community 
just like there is a politically active segment of the Christian community, the business community, the immigrant community, the education community, and on and on. And we all know that there are many politically active Christians who claim to speak for all Christians, and they don't speak for all Christians. Christians as a whole have very diverse political convictions and goals on a lot of different issues. And the same is true in the LGBTQ community. Lots of diversity on everything. So we must not read a news article here or there and think that we know what the gay agenda is or how all LGBTQ people think or feel about a particular topic any more than we can do that with Christians or white people or black people or any group. We have to get to know individual people and listen to their individual stories before we can understand or say anything helpful to anyone. And second, we keep getting a lot of questions about where we stand on same-sex marriage. We keep answering those questions by referring people to our position paper on Christian marriage, which is on our website and hasn't changed. Very simply, as Richard described last week, we continue to hold to the belief that the biblical definition of marriage is between one man and one woman till death us depart, and sexual expression is reserved solely for marriage and everyone else is called to celibacy. And we have no authority from Christ or scripture to change that definition. Thus, DRCC elders and pastors will not perform same-sex marriages. Now, I do really encourage everyone to read that paper and take note of what we have said clearly and what we have not said. We deliberately did not try to write a paper that laid out a legal code of all the different ways to violate the biblical understanding of marriage and sexual ethics, because that would be an infinitely long and unedifying document. We did make clear in that paper that in our opinion as elders, the main threat to the Christian institution of marriage does not come from same-sex people who want to marry, but from heterosexual people who violate and cast aside their marriage vows through unfaithfulness and divorce. That's a far more common problem in our society. And we did not seek to go into great detail on all the ways Christians regularly violate God's ideal for marriage and sexuality, nor how the church will respond to all these different violations, because again, it would be an unending document. We deal with problems concerning Christian sexual ethics as they come up in our life together pastorally, individually, one-on-one, -on -one, couple by couple. Because the stories and the problems and the questions are always unique and messy and difficult. And we seek to prayerfully walk alongside each other in brokenness and seek confession and forgiveness and healing and renewed faithfulness to pursuing God's ideal. Now we've had a lot of people bring up sort of hypothetical situations and say, what would you do if this happened? And on the one hand, we appreciate the desire behind these questions to really wrestle with the issues and think through how to apply God's word and God's grace. And on the other hand, hypothetical situations are not real situations. So while there is a certain amount of value in trying to run a practice analysis, we can't claim to provide a complete set of answers to all the questions in this arena, and we're not going to try. We do hope that as our doors and our hearts are opened, and as people feel freer to share struggles and identities that they might previously have thought better to keep hidden, that we will be led by God's spirit in a godly and Christ-like response to those questions as they come up. Third, many people have also raised the question of leadership in the church. Will LGBTQ people be allowed to be leaders in DRCC? We can clearly say that one's sexual uh, orientation is not a prerequisite or a disqualifier for leadership at DRCC. There are two main qualifiers for leadership here. One, does the potential leader have a servant's heart? And do they understand that Christian leadership is not a right? It's not a position of power. It's not a title that you earn or deserve. It's not a job promotion. But rather, it is a position of serving the body of Christ of thinking first and foremost of the needs of others rather than self, and of being willing to sacrificially serve in the same way that Christ served his disciples and the church. And two, does the potential leader commit to honoring and living out our statement of belief 
and our position papers, including on Christian marriage and sexual ethics and on women in leadership. Now, this second qualification is not meant to indicate whether we think someone is saved or whether they're a mature Christian or anything like that. It's just a practical necessity that those who lead in a group of any kind be able to support the core beliefs, convictions, and practices of that group. Fourth, Jesus died on the cross for the sin of all humanity. And we all stand equally guilty before the cross and through the cross, we are all equally offered God's grace and acceptance. And all of us must bring only our need and our willingness to give our lives to Jesus as Lord, just as we are. And once we do that, that leads to our fifth point. Then, we, once we have accepted Christ's sacrifice on our behalf and made him Lord, his spirit can begin to transform us. And we all need a lot of transformation. And that is a very personal and unique process for each person. Only God saves and transforms. And God's transformation happens only in the lives of those who have committed themselves to him. And the timing of that transformation is up to God. As Christians, we are called to be most critical of our own sins and shortcomings and embody God's kindness and patience towards each other as we live and grow in community. And we must constantly be mindful that we are quick to judge and define the sins and struggles which are different from our own. And we are extremely lenient and tolerant and even reluctant to identify the sins that we struggle with. And that's just true for every human being. And six, rather than seeing and dividing ourselves into heterosexual and LGBTQ groups, what if we thought of it this way? We are all created in God's image, and therefore we are all of infinite value and worth to God. And we are all also physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually born disfigured and disabled at some level by sin. Because we still bear the image of God, we are all positively oriented to desire love and intimacy and community. And because God's image in all of us is defaced by sin, we are also all negatively oriented to seek to fulfill those God-given desires in ways that are self-centered and self-defined rather than God-centered. And we are all constantly bedeviled by the lie that we, rather than God, can best define what's good and right for ourselves. The more that we can see that we all share the image of God, and we are all beset by the same big picture lie of sin, then the greater could be our awareness of our common need for God's grace and salvation. And we won't have a need to rank or exclude certain types of sins and wounds and struggles over others. And seventh, had to be seven points. Richard made sure there's seven points. Keep the conversation going. Christ's truth is transformational as it is experienced in Christian community and as we talk and wrestle and pray and study and seek God's will together. So if those seven things are clear and shared values and understandings from this series, then that's a great start and we'll continue the conversation. But now let's move to scripture and take a look at a story that I think will help us imagine how to embody these values in real life. Jesus told a lot of stories, often in response to people's questions. And in fact, Matthew and Mark say that Jesus spoke to the crowds always and only with parables and stories. And it was only to his disciples that he would explain the meaning. Stories are powerful because they help us understand and imagine how to live. We can observe different characters. We can try them on. We can see the outcomes of their decisions, all without actually having to live that action ourselves. So stories are a powerful way to grow our moral and relational understanding. And we're going to end our series today by looking at a story that Jesus told, because stories are so often a way we can look at issues in a different light, not just from a logical, philosophical, or analytical perspective, because the LGBTQ conversation is ultimately not about abstract concepts, but about real people 
And thus, it's hugely important that we keep wrestling and getting our understanding right and biblical and Christ-centered. So let's read together the story of the Good Samaritan from Luke 10. I'll read it, and it's also up on the screen. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he also passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who did mercy to him. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So our story starts out with a lawyer, a teacher of the law. This would be God's law, the Mosaic law. And he comes to test Jesus, and he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is a quid pro quo kind of question. What is the thing I can do that will then earn or obligate God to give me eternal life? Jesus asks him what is in the law, and he quotes the famous summary of the law, love God and love your neighbor. And Jesus says, that's right, do that and you will live. So the setup here is that we have an expert in God's law who wants to test Jesus and justify himself. And he's not really looking for information. He's a legal expert, and he already knows the law and what it says. He's here to get Jesus to confirm the picture he already has of himself. Someone who knows the law is doing it, and therefore he's guaranteed to get eternal life. And Jesus seems to go along with this at first. He confirmed, yes, you do know God's law, and just go do it and you'll have eternal life. Seems like a pretty short story. Except the lawyer, like all good lawyers, wants to tie up every loose end. Just make sure he doesn't inadvertently screw up. So he asks, and who is my neighbor? And of course, this question implies that there are some people who are not his neighbor, some people that he's not obligated to love, and he wants to make sure that he's got that group of people correctly defined. He's probably already going through the list of people in his mind. He surely doesn't have to love the nasty, oppressive Roman occupiers, certainly not the stinking, pig-eating, sexually immoral Gentiles, Not the women who are uneducated and annoying, not the leper who's been cursed by God, not that poor person down the street because he knows why he's poor, he's always making bad decisions, Uh, not the tax collector who's a completely unpatriotic traitor. He's already running through the list in his mind as he asks the question. But instead of answering the question and defining this group for him, Jesus tells a story. So in this story we just read, we have a few characters We have the traveler who's on a journey, minding his own business, when he is set upon by an evil and vicious band of robbers. And we also have the priest and the Levite, a Samaritan, and an innkeeper. So let's imagine ourselves in this story. And if we were living this story, which character would we want to be? So can you raise your hands if you would like to be the traveler who gets robbed, beaten, and left half dead? No takers for that role, okay. How about the robbers? Does anyone want to be the robber in this story? Good, no one. There was one taker for that, um, a young person in the first service. 
<laughs> playing cops and robbers before church, probably. How about the priest or the Levite? Does anyone want to be one of those characters? No, no one there. Okay, what about the Samaritan? Who would like to be the Samaritan? Oh, that's lots of people for that. What about the innkeeper? Okay, we've got some people. Okay, all right. So this is good. I'm glad no one wanted to be the robber in this service and or the uh, priest or Levite because none of those people are obviously the heroes of the story. And I understand that the wounded traveler is not a very fun role either. But um, it seems like everyone wanted to be either the Samaritan hero or the innkeeper, which is obviously the second best role. He's not evil, negligent, or half dead. <laughs> and... This is indeed how we generally interpret this story in our modern day. We look at it as an ethical story about how we should all be willing to help those in need. And we'd all rather be the helper than the one getting helped if we have a choice. But I want to look at this story through another lens, and this was the lens used by many of the church fathers in the early centuries of the church, because they read this story differently, allegorically, and with this lens, they saw the figure of the Samaritan as representing Christ, who came to rescue humanity, which through Adam's sin had been robbed by the devil and left for dead by the side of the road. Clement of Alexandria writes of the Samaritan, who else can this be but the Savior himself? Or who more than he has pitied us, who have been almost done to death by the world rulers of the darkness with these many wounds, with fears and lusts and wraths, griefs, deceits, and pleasures. Of these wounds, Jesus is the only healer. And Augustine says, Robbers left you half dead on the road, but you have been found lying there by the passing and kindly Samaritan. Wine and oil have been poured on you. You have received the sacrament of the only begotten Son. You have been lifted onto his mule. Augustine sees the wine and oil as representing the cleansing and healing work of Christ, symbolizing the sacrament of communion. And the painting in this slide tells the story in the um, language of the visual language of the 1500s. And notice as we view art going up to the modern era as these slides go along, how each work includes the figure of the wounded traveler, the Samaritan giving aid, and the priest and Levite fading and wandering into the distance. For the church fathers, and this interpretation continues down through history, even as seen in these works of art all to the modern day, the priest and the Levite are not just examples of callous, heartless, self-focused people, but they are symbols of the law and the prophets, which could not rescue or save mankind. And notice as we go through the paintings, these characters are always trailing into the distance, impotent and unhelpful compared to the Samaritan Christ figure. Origen put it this way, the man who was going down is Adam, Jerusalem is paradise, and Jericho is the world. The robbers are hostile powers. The priest is the law, the Levite is the prophets, and the Samaritan is Christ. The wounds are disobedience, and the beast is the Lord's body. It's worth noting here that the priest and the Levite would have represented respected and high-status members of Jewish society. They were born into priestly families. They had respected bloodlines. They lived lives that were centered on the temple and the law, which was the high point of Jewish society. And in contrast, the Samaritans were deeply despised by Jews. The Samaritans worshiped the same God, but they had different theology and worship practices. They had mixed ethnic background, as they were descended not only from Jews, but also from intermarriage with Gentiles during and after the exile to Babylon. And hostility between the two groups sometimes broke out into violence, and Jewish people heartily disliked and disdained the Samaritans. They considered them to be firmly outside the boundary of God's people, and certainly not examples of anything good. So it is truly significant that Jesus makes the hero of this story a Samaritan, rather than the culturally respected figures of the priest and Levite. Instead, it is an ethnic and religious outcast who is portrayed as fulfilling the law much more fully than the supposed experts and protectors of the law. 
And the story turns on the difference in emotional reaction to the plight of the traveler. The priest and Levite each see the wounded traveler, but no emotional reaction is recorded for them. Each just choose to draw, by, draw away and pass him by. And we don't know why they make this choice. Fear for their own safety, maybe they're busy, they have an appointment to keep, perhaps they've judged that the traveler probably wasn't as careful as he should be and maybe deserved his fate, or maybe they just don't care at all. Only their actions, not their motives, are given to us. And perhaps this is because from Jesus' perspective, it is their actions that matter more than their motives in this story. Whatever their reasons, good or bad, understandable or puzzling, the central feature about the priest and Levite is their failure to act and help the wounded traveler. Now, in contrast, the Samaritan's emotional response is recorded. When he sees the wounded traveler, he has compassion for him. Now, the Greek word used here for compassion, for having compassion, appears 12 times in the Gospels and not in the rest of the New Testament. Jesus uses this word in two other parables, one to describe the reaction of the father when the prodigal son is returning home, and the reaction of the master who forgives the debt of his servant. And all the other occurrences refer to Jesus' own feelings of compassion for individuals and crowds that he encounters during his ministry. He has compassion for the helpless, shepherdless crowds who come to him, and in response, he provides healing and food. He has compassion for two blind men, a leper, a demon-possessed boy and his father, and a widow who has lost her son. And in each case, he extends his power to heal and even to raise from the dead. The fact that this word is always associated with Jesus or with figures in parables who represent God indeed lends credibility to the patristic identification of the Samaritan with Christ. Origen also draws the identification of Jesus with the Samaritan from John 8, 48 to 49, where Jesus is accused by the Jewish leaders of being a Samaritan and having a demon. Basically, that is the worst insult that they can just think to come up with. But Origen notices that Jesus denies having a demon, but he does not deny the identity of Samaritan. Now, this compassion felt by the Samaritan leads him to take the opposite set of actions from the priest or the Levite. Instead of drawing away, he draws near. Instead of going on his way, he stops and gives aid. And this aid goes far and above and beyond anything that most Jews would have expected as fulfillment of the command to love neighbor. All of the Samaritan's actions exhibit a total lack of concern for his own safety and resources, and complete extravagant generosity toward the wounded traveler who is a total stranger to him. He draws near, he dresses the wounds with oil and wine and bandages, he loads the man on his donkey, at this point, he's putting himself in danger of the same fate, just in case those robbers are still hanging around. He takes the traveler to an inn where he cares for him further. He recruits and pays the innkeeper to give him additional care. And he also opens an unlimited account to ensure that the innkeeper can continue to render aid to the wounded traveler for as long as necessary, promising to settle up when he returns. And by the way, innkeepers had quite a mixed reputation in the ancient world. They were often known as frauds and scoundrels. So the Samaritan, in writing a blank check, is risking being taken advantage of. Now, the church fathers commonly interpreted this part of the story to symbolize Christ bringing rescued sinners into the church for care and healing. Origen says, he takes the half-dead man to the inn, the church, which accepts all people and does not refuse help to anyone, since Jesus says to all, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Origen goes on to specifically identify the church as the place which accepts all who wish to enter. In fact, the Greek word which Luke uses for in here in this passage appears only here in the entire New Testament. And it literally means a house of welcome to all, from pan, all, and dokeo, welcome or receive. 
It's not the same word as the inn that had no room for Jesus in Luke 2. This is a word which conveys a sense of all-embracing room for everyone. And likewise, the word for innkeeper is a form of pandokion, pandoke, meaning a host who receives all. Augustine goes on to say to believers, you have been brought to the inn, and you are being cured in the church. This is what I, too, and what all of us are doing. We are performing the duties of the innkeeper. He was told, if you spend more, I will repay you when I return. If only we spent at least as much as we have received. However much we spend, brothers and sisters, it is the Lord's money. Augustine succinctly sums up the common view of many early interpreters, which saw the inn as the church where all could be welcomed, cared for, healed, and then joined the staff to care for the next wounded traveler rescued and brought by the Samaritan. But always this care would be rendered from the resources that the former travelers had themselves received from Christ, his mercy, his care, his blessings, and material resources. Theologian Rima Rukama, summing up the early interpreter, says, before they, Christians, were ready to identify themselves with the Samaritan who showed his love for a wounded man, they first had identified themselves with the wounded man helped by the Samaritan who was represented by other Christians. The early interpreters saw it as essential for Christians to identify first and foremost with the wounded man before they could identify as the innkeeper and eventually the Samaritan. Before they could heed Jesus' application of the story to go and do thou likewise, they had to acknowledge their own brokenness, their own rescue, their own hospitalization and recovery. Now, this is exactly what the lawyer did not want to do. In raising the question, who is my neighbor, he clearly sought to justify himself and to justify his own judgments about who was a neighbor, who was worthy of his love and care. But in answering, Jesus transforms his question from a self-centered one, who is my neighbor, who do I have to love, who do I not have to love, to an other-centered question. Which character was a neighbor? Who demonstrated love? Who loved? The lawyer finds himself trapped by his own initial questions. Rephrased by Jesus, he must answer that the one who did mercy is the one who has fulfilled the law whose application he sought to limit. He can't even bring himself to name the character the hated Samaritan who he had never viewed as a person deserving care, much less as an example. He can only call him the one. And I just want to pause for a minute and ask, if the Samaritan illustrates how Christ treats us, if we are called to imitate Christ and to participate in his mission, how does this picture of a risk-taking savior, of complete lack of concern for one's own safety, of generous and open-ended use of resources on behalf of a stranger, how does that impact our thought process as Christians? Could that inform how we view the poor, refugees, immigrants, and a variety of outcasts and wounded travelers who are so often ignored and passed by in our culture today? Are we tempted to put certain groups of people into that category of people who are not my neighbor, people I don't have to love, people who deserve to lie by the side of the road rather than receive my care. And even as we forget that we ourselves have been in desperate need of the Savior's rescue, every bit as hopeless and lost apart from him as any other person. Karl Barth, probably one of the greatest theologians, Christ-centered theologians of the 20th century, brings forward the patristic interpretation and ends his comments on this Bible passage with these words. The good Samaritan, the neighbor who is a helper and will make him a helper, is not far from this lawyer. The primitive exegesis of the text was fundamentally right. He stands before him incarnate, although hidden under the form of one whom the lawyer believed he should hate as the Jews hated the Samaritans. 
Jesus does not accuse the man, although judgment obviously hangs over him. Judgment is preceded by grace. Before this neighbor makes his claim, he makes his offer. Go and do likewise means follow thou me. Every one of us stands in exactly the same position before Jesus as this lawyer. And to us, Christ hold, holds out his offer of judgment or grace. It's up to us which one we accept. And whatever we have received is what we have to give. I'm going to ask the music team to come out and share a song with us which expresses so beautifully the care that the Samaritan Christ has given to each of us. Most of us have probably at some point in our lives, maybe many times, found ourselves battered and wounded on the side of the road, not knowing if we had the strength to carry on, wondering who would help us. And some of you may even be there right now. So let's listen and be reminded of the one who alone is always good, and has promised to be always faithful and always there, and to be our savior and example of care for others. Would you bow your head and pray with me? Dear Father in heaven, as we reflect on this song and your story of the Good Samaritan, we have prayers of confession and prayers of petition on our hearts. As we have looked at each character, we have been convicted anew of the many possibilities for our lives. We never want to be the robbers who beat up and abuse and steal from the vulnerable traveler. We ask for your grace to keep us from the horror of ever playing such a role. We confess that if we are honest, there are times when we have been the priest or the Levite, passing by and avoiding the needs of the wounded traveler. We have been afraid to give help afraid for our own safety, for our own priorities, and we have hurried on by rather than stopped to give aid. Forgive us and help us to avoid a repeat of this failing. And we further acknowledge that we have each, in fact, been the wounded traveler, beaten, helpless, left for dead. How difficult it was in that role to contemplate our broken condition Survival often seemed to mean denying the brokenness that we didn't know how to fix. We were dead men walking, unable to help or rescue ourselves. We don't like to think about it. We don't like to remember that awful experience, but we acknowledge that this was our reality before you came along. And then wonder of wonders, there you were, the Savior, the Samaritan, the last person we would have expected to bring help. You cleansed and bandaged our wounds. You brought us to a place of safety and committed us to a house of welcome where others also cared for us. Eventually, as we recovered from our desperate state, we were able to join those others in caring for the wounded travelers that you, the Samaritan, kept finding and bringing to us. And sometimes we have had the courage and the strength to accompany you as little Samaritans. We have had the courage to go back out onto that scary, dangerous road, looking for the victims that bring back the memories of our own assault and rescue. We are humbled and grateful for the opportunity to imitate you and to participate in your ongoing mission of rescue. We remember that we cannot rescue anyone on our own, only as we are in you and walk with you. And remember that we all, no matter how long ago our rescue, are still all equally guests in your guest house, a guest house that is open to all, welcomes and accepts all, saved, empowered, and healed by your grace and mercy and not our own. Help us to continue to grow and heal and to invite others into the growth and healing that only you can accomplish in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for hanging with us during this series. Keep the conversation going. And if you want to pray or talk with any of our elders and prayer ministers, we'd love to see you down front.